Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. What is big data and how can you profit from it? My name is Larissa Green and joining me shortly, we will have Joe Hagen um, joining us as well with Wealth Colony and he's gonna give us some information on big data and really where we're seeing it in today's world. So it's really a big part of our daily lives and it's really good to keep up on the information that is just really continually coming to us about big data and how we can utilize it, but also how can you profit from it? So what investments are out there for you as an investor and where can you put your money? So it's gonna be a lot of good information. Again, my name is Larissa Green. I'm with Advana IRA and so what we do is we hold self-directed retirement accounts. And I am gonna tell you a little bit about that. So for those of you viewing this presentation, we'll have a better understanding of what you can do with a self-directed IRA and really how it sort of relates to information on things like big data and other presentations that we do throughout the year. I am Director of Education and I'm a business development team member here at Advana. I've been with Advana IRA since 2011. And what I do basically is host a lot of presentations like this. We also have networking events that are now virtual going on a couple of times a month. Everybody is welcome to join us. And our job in business development really is to educate people and answer questions that they have on self-directed IRAs. So we know a lot of people haven't heard of self-directed retirement accounts. And so we're here to help you understand how they work and the rules that the IRS has provided for these types of accounts. What we can't do is provide any investment advice, any legal tax or investment advice. And so it's gonna be up to you as the account holder to do due diligence on any investments that it is you'd like to make. Reach out to your professional team, your attorney, your CPA, and ask them the questions that you might have regarding a specific investment. If you have questions on the rule or uh, the rules or the process, that's what Advana IRA and our team members are here to help you with. A little bit about Advana. We are, again, a self-directed retirement um, administ uh, account administrator. What that means is we're considered a third-party administrator for retirement accounts. We hold the retirement account. You find the investment and we help you get it done in the name of the IRA. So we don't sell any market-based investments at all. We don't sell any investments at all. It's up to our clients to find the investment they want to make and put their money to work. What we do is hold the account and help you get those investments done in the name of the retirement account. And then we'll also do your IRS reporting and record keeping of those assets. We have two uh, offices. We, are, we can work with anybody anywhere, but our offices are located in Largo or the Tampa Bay area of Florida. And then we're also in Atlanta, Georgia. But like I said, we can help anybody anywhere. As long as you have a US-based retirement account, you can self-direct it and we can help you get that done. We have classes all the time, as I mentioned, and um, we're always here to answer your questions. And we really try to give you a personal feel on your retirement account, meaning that any account holder with us does have a um, personal account rep and they're there to answer any questions from anything from contribution limits on an annual basis all the way through to helping you with your transaction. Here's information on our events. Um, you can always check us out at vantaira.com forward slash events to see what we have on our calendar. We also have a video library and you can also access those videos on YouTube. Everything gets archived there as well. And we keep you up to date on all the latest um, in our space with our blog. So if you are interested, you can always go to our website and sign up to be on our invite list and we'll send you our blog articles. And anytime we have a webinar going on like this, you'll receive an invite to join us live. So what is a self-directed IRA? Well, very specifically, our definition of a self-directed IRA is gonna be a little bit different than those um, definitions used by your brokerage firm. So we're really not competing with brokerage firms because we do something different. We sort of fill the gap in the industry where we hold assets they're not willing to hold. You know, Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley, Fidelity, those are all great brokerage accounts. Um, but what they do is allow you to invest in things that are market traded. And so you might have a self-directed account with them where you get to choose from the list of investments that you want to make and trade, buy, sell stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. But what we do is, is very different in that we only hold private investments. 
anything from buy and hold real estate all the way through to things like cryptocurrency and gold and silver bars. So that's what our definition of a self-directed IRA is. And so we're helping those clients that either don't want to be invested in the market at all, or they want to self-direct a portion of their retirement account and truly diversify their account by sending funds over to us for maybe one or two specific investments. And so that's what we're helping our clients do. And you can see, I have a short list up here of the different assets that we see here at Advana, but the IRS really hasn't said, here's a list of things you can invest in. What they've done instead is given us a very short list of things you can't invest in. And so when you're talking about a self-directed IRA, just about the sky is the limit for those accounts. And so, as I mentioned, buy and hold real estate. And again, we're not finding the investment for you. So it's gonna be up to you to go out there and find it what it is that you wanna invest in, um, negotiate the terms, and then let us know we're here to, once that part portion is done, we're gonna here to help you do the paperwork. So if you wanna buy 123 Main Street and hold on to it and rent it out, that's completely up to you and we help you get that done. You can lend money. It could be in the form of a mortgage, it could be an unsecured note, a second mortgage, a third mortgage, those things, again, are all up to the account holder. Private placements, that's a big one because those private equity funds will not typically be held by your brokerage account. And then the rules for um, their fiduciary laws have changed a lot over the last few years. And so where you know a brokerage firm might have been willing to hold that at one time, they are typically no longer willing to. And so that's again where we come in and we can hold those assets. Precious metals is a big one for a self-directed IRA. It can be gold and silver bars or co and coins. It can be um, a lot of different precious metals. And again, um, there would there is a specific list for those metals. So if that's something you're interested in, let us know. Foreign currency exchange, futures trading. We've seen people um, hold farm equipment um, that uh, you know is secured to a note. We've seen people lease land to hunters and farmers. So really, a lot of creative investments when you're talking about a self-directed IRA. Most people just haven't heard about these accounts because there's not a lot of companies out there like Advana willing to hold these accounts. Brokerage firms typically consider these assets hard to value. They don't want to have to worry about the fiduciary responsibility that they may take on by allowing uh, clients to make these investments. And so they don't want to have to receive rental income or pay mortgages on behalf of a retirement account. And that's really what we're set up to do. And so, um, you know, being that there is so few of us out there a lot of people haven't heard about it. I know a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody on the phone, they say, you can invest in real estate in an IRA. Is that something new? Because I've never heard of that before. And the truth is, it's actually always been allowed since 1974. You've been allowed to make those investments. And, you know, just a, um, some information for you at the bottom of the slide here, it's actually less than 4% of all, and it says IRA investments, but it's actually all a retirement accounts are invested in these types of private investments. So why do people self-direct? Um, the first one, of course, is just gonna be a new source of capital. They had no idea they had access to their retirement accounts to make private investments, and so they can use those funds to make the investments that maybe they wanted to make, and they were just struggling to come up with where they were going to maybe cash out of some personal investments to make those investments, and now, you know, a whole new world has opened up in, in that you can use a retirement account. Um, stock market fatigue, and I know that's, you know, really sort of something that we're seeing a lot right now, you know, in the time that we're living in, the stock market has been up and down a lot over the last six months, and, you know, it's kind of been a scary ride, and so a lot of people are reaching out now and saying, you know what, I just don't want to have to worry about it anymore. It's just up and down so much, especially now that they're seeing the benefit of really diversifying their portfolio. And then of course the tax benefits, making those investments and having them grow tax free, uh, tax deferred or tax free is a huge benefit. If you think about making an investment, especially in your Roth IRA and having that investment grow tax free, you know, outside of the stock market, you might have something that's gonna have much better returns and that investment can go right into your Roth IRA and again, grow tax free. So I like to show everybody the types of accounts that can be self-directed. And then the very 
first reason for that is because oftentimes when I speak to people, they say to me, well, I don't have a Roth IRA, so I can't self-direct it. And I'm not really sure where that comes from, but the truth is if it ends in IRA, it can be self-directed. There's also a few other plans up here that you may not be aware of as well. So traditional and Roth, of course, those are the most common types of accounts that we see. We also have employer-based plans listed here. So the simple IRA, a SEP IRA, and any former employer plan with emphasis on former because once you've severed ties and you're no longer participating in that plan, that you have to be allowed to move it. But sometimes when you're currently employed, your current employer um, will not allow you to move it. The plan rules will not allow you to move funds. And it of course always just depends. So if you're currently participating, you would just check with your plan documents, check in with your plan administrator and see if you're allowed to make that move. I also have a pure solo 401ks and that's you know, a big benefit to those that are self-employed. So self-employed individuals can have a one participant plan. It's called a solo 401k and it has a lot of benefits and it can also be self-directed. I also have a pure health savings accounts and education savings accounts. And although I know those are not retirement accounts, the rules for self-directing them are gonna be exactly the same as IRAs and 401ks. And so we can hold those types of accounts for you as well. I've seen a lot of more, a lot more interest in health savings accounts in um, recent years. And so if you have questions on those types of accounts, just let me know. And so with that, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Joe. Joe, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Larissa, for having me. Um, so uh, it's an honor, it's a, it's a privilege. And before I start, um, I'd just like to give a shout out to not only, um, you know, Advanta, but specifically Larissa um, in the world of education in this space, as well as bringing on new accounts. Um, and in my situation, um, the uh, account manager is Courtney. So they really operate as a team, um, hands-on, responsible, uh, responsive, I should say, accessible, um, makes the process very seamless um, and for that i you know i appreciate um and uh you know i'm in well, gratitude thank yes thank you so much joe i appreciate that no you're welcome um certainly you've earned that um there are some different companies out there that you could deal with and again there's a reason why i'm on this call because the experience is the most seamless um you know at advanta you know and i get that not only from myself but also from you know my friends family clients customers um, that have decided to self-direct um, any opportunities that at Wealth Colony we introduce them to and they decide. Um, so again, it's a, you know, a win-win. And like you said, um, there is a lot of stock market fatigue out there, particularly in, in, in my experience with, you know, um, a lot of, you know, even millennials, but really baby boomers um, that are retiring and you see the market go from 30,000 down to 18,000. You know, seemingly it feels like a blink of an eye when you've worked that hard, you know, uh, to earn that, that, that money and build that capital and then to see it, you know, um, potentially vaporize it. You know, you think long-term it's gonna come back, but when you're retiring, you know, what's long-term? So there is more of an appetite for what I call secure, um, whether it's secured with real estate, whatever it may be, uh, but to earn a certain return that you're comfortable with, knowing that you have some principal protection and, you, and you're getting a solid return. And if you can get one that outperforms the market and have more security there, that's become you know more and more popular. And that's why um, a lot of people, um, I believe, have the self-directed market has been growing, okay? And within the self-directed space, um, I would say that alternative investments, um, you know, those that would fit into a self-directed IRA like at Advanta are really growing. Pricewaterhouse recently put out a report that showed since 2018 to 2020, the alternative asset industry has grown 60% in just two years. And this report came out before COVID, right? Uh, before that hit uh, earlier this year uh, to $15 trillion. Um, also right before COVID, um, you saw Forbes write an article that discussed how alternative investments can really improve your portfolio. In fact, they said you should have 30% allocation 
of your portfolio in alternative investments. Um, and they also say, if you're really conservative, 20%. So clearly, they see alternatives as an important piece of your portfolio, um, and we do as well. So there are a lot of different um, alternatives. Um, let me just introduce our company first, Wealth Colony, just tell you a little bit about um, who we are and how we got onto big data. We were founded in 2013. You know, and our mission is basically, we want to provide access to some of these unique set back alternative investments, right? Um, you know, we've been in different opportunities and the one that really presents itself in a major way in the last year and a half for us has been big data uh, because we recognize that it's an industry that not only is growing, uh, but it's something that really um, it has, you know, a, a, a lot of um, longevity as far as how like, big data is changing the way we do every single thing and every single day. Definitely several times a week, I'm reading very interesting articles on big data and the advancements that are being made and how it's going to change what we do. So um, just really, you know, just to finish up with Connie for us, you know, we look to align ourselves with those kind of world-class partners in that space. Um, and, I, you know, we learn a lot, which I'd like to share here. Um, but certainly for those that want to take action in that space, the niche for us has been the self-directed IRA. So um, that's why I'm happy here to um, be discussing um, this type of opportunity uh, as it relates to big data in a self-directed IRA. So the first question is, you know, what is big data, right? Big data is described as data in huge size, yet it's still growing exponentially, right? Um, there are a lot of examples of big data uh, generation that happen every second, every day, right? Social media sites, Facebook has something like 500 terabytes per day of data created, uh, whereas the New York Stock Exchange would have only one terabyte per day, but it's still a lot. A jet engine, it generates 10 terabytes of data in just 30 minutes of flight time. And there are obviously thousands of flights per day, you know, even in today's environment, there are a lot of flights. So you can imagine the amount of data being created. Uh, big data is an essential component of what we are currently in, known as the fourth industrial revolution. So constantly in everything we do, even in kids' toys, right? Data is being collected, stored, processed, um, you know, and, and, and used um, in business for actionable intelligence, um, you know, in a big data strategy. But uh, that's, that's a phenomenon that's not going to change. And that's why data centers can, around the world uh, certainly continue to, to, to be built uh, um, as far as... Uh, I talked about our company already, Wealth Colony. These are some of the things that we've done. Um, the types of data uh, really are in three forms, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. So structured data is that type of data that is, you know, stored, accessed, and processed in a fixed format, right? If you think of an employee table, uh, you'll have, you know, the name, the gender, the department, the salary, et cetera. Okay. If you take unstructured data, it's any data that's huge and unstructured. There's a big challenge here. There's a lot of value here, but there's a big challenge in processing that data to derive the value. Okay. Um, one source can be a text file, a video, et cetera. So there are many organizations that have a wealth of this data that's available. They just don't know how to really pull the value out of it. Okay. And that challenge is uh, you know, challenge for some companies, obviously, is an opportunity for those who can, you know, pull that value out of it, you know, and that's where we talk about monetizing, you know, big data. But, uh, you know, in its raw form, unstructured uh, data, you know, is constant output that can be returned by a Google search or Hadoop's big data. When you talk about semi-structured data, um, that can contain both, both uh, structured and unstructured data. You could have some personal data stored in an XML file, and that'll give you an example of both, um, you know, structured and unstructured data. The characteristics of data, uh, they call it the four Vs. You're talking about um, variety, velocity, volume, 
and uh, variability. So in volume, it's obvious it relates to the size that's just enormous. Uh, size is crucial in determining the value of the data. Uh, it's the most primary characteristic in considering whether or not it's big data. Variety goes back to the types, structured, unstructured, semi-structured. In the early days, most applications considered only structured data, like spreadsheets and databases. It was more cut and dry. Again, today with information technology, you have the Internet of Things, you have emails, you have photos that are now digital and 3D and facial recognition and videos and monitoring devices like Ring, PDFs, audio. There's just a ton of unstructured data that is really, really valuable information. Again, poses a lot of challenges for companies to store, process, analyze, and provide that data. Um, and that's where there's a lot of opportunity, particularly in monetizing big data. Uh, the velocity is just the speed. I mean, how fast is this data generated and processed to meet the demands? You have sensors. If you have an autonomous vehicle, for example, I think NVIDIA is one great company that has two, 300 chips in a vehicle. Um, and it can process information quicker than the human eye in most cases. Uh, and, you know, that's just one application. You can talk about social media, mobile devices. There's just a massive and continuous flow of data that they have to contend with. Um, so that's the velocity, how quick the, the, the um, variability is really, it's the inconsistency show, shown by the data, right? Um, sometimes this inconsistency will really hamper the process of handling and managing the data effectively. So it's definitely a characteristic that needs to be understood if you're going to, um, you know, look in the world of big data. The general benefits Okay. Oh, you know what, Joe, before you go on, um, sure. just going back to what you said about the Internet of Things, can you just briefly describe what that means for those people that don't know? Because I think, you know, that's important because when you're talking about how there's just so much information being, um, you know, pulled and put together for, you know, every walk of life, really, just every, everything that we're doing on a daily basis. Can you just give us sort of the definition of the Internet of Things? Yeah, so the Internet of Things is literally like everything you, uh, just about everything you touch is somehow connected to the Internet, right? Um, you know, they call it the next big thing, right? So if you have, I mentioned before, kids' toys, you know, it's collecting information on, you know, on how you play, you know, how, how kids are, you know, using or playing with a toy uh you know you can take a disney park and they give you bands and they're gonna you know access everything you're doing in the park and you're connected to the internet it's measuring you know what you're doing and in one breath you can call that an invasion of privacy and the other breath you could turn around and say you know what they're measuring it not to invade your privacy but just to measure um what it is that you're doing so they can provide a better customer experience but okay you know, okay just, thank you you're welcome. It's really just the world becoming just increasingly more connected, more digitized, um, and you know, companies that can access that data from billions of intelligent devices will get this, 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 you know, really important. I mean, they they, they call data the new oil because it's worth more. They can take that data and they can make you know better decisions. Um, they can connect to their customers quicker. They can have shorter response times to market demands. They can be, again, more efficient, more flexible, uh, better production quality. And it also, when you start mixing Internet of Things with artificial intelligence, it'll show your business with that data all kinds of new business opportunities. So really, it's just everything being connected, you know, and just more and more data being generated that's being able to be measured, processed, stored, and analyzed and used. Um, what happens as a result in this world of big data, generally speaking, is medical breakthroughs. We're going to live a lot longer. It's known to be a job killer, and people have to or go in. Many industries are going to have to be retrained, uh, but you know we're going to live longer. There's some stats about people that are born in 2007. I mean, the 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 life expectancy, I don't forget how many years ago, it used to be 50, but there's a stat I was reading recently, and don't quote me here, but it's something I, I think 10 or 15 percent of the kids born in 2007 are, have a life expectancy of like, uh, you know, 5 percent of them or 10 percent of them live to 100 and 5 percent of them live to 105, right? There's just, just life expectancy, and that's going to be exacerbated as we get more and more 
you know, big data analytics. Like take, for example, breast cancer. They can just really do what a human can't, what a radiologist can't, you know, in a million years, go through all these mammograms, find these little distinctive patterns that really would take just too long for a human to, to, to study. And by just studying these patterns, they'll be able to look at these mammograms and say, hey, you know what, you, you're going to get breast cancer in five years. So obviously prevention and early detection um, in any cancer is just huge. Um, and, and, and the same can be said, you know, for Parkinson's and a lot of other um, so there's going to be a lot of medical breakthroughs, and we're going to live longer. Uh, in real time right now, there's a lot of fraud potential, uh, fraud uh, detection, rather, that happens in the banking industry. Um, it really improves customer service, generally speaking, in business. Um, and again, there are, there, there are, if you take customer service now, right, and some people don't even realize, I know my mom, I can tell right away, but my mom probably doesn't realize she's speaking to, you know, uh, a computer. You know, because they'll have natural language processing technologies that can read and evaluate consumer responses. And if it wasn't for the amount of data being fed into this program, they wouldn't be able to have these new systems with natural language processing technology. So, um, you know, those are some of the, the, the applications that, you know, help companies because it's cheaper to obviously have a computer speak to you than to pay somebody healthcare and wages, et cetera. Um, but there is, uh, a, a lot of operational efficiency overall that happens when you have a big data strategy. Uh, in 2019, the world, uh, uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum said that, you know, by 2022, like 60% of global GDP will be digital. And they said, if you as a company, small, big or large, don't have a big data strategy, you're going to fail period. Um, and so when I ask the question, you know, how is that going to help? Uh, one of the guys that are way above my pay grade to try to bring it down into layman's terms, explain to me that put it this way, when you have big data, you can have your Alexa sitting next to you on a desk, right? And you can plug certain data into it. And you can ask Alexa questions like, you know, who is my, what account am I in fear? Am I in jeopardy of losing declining you know, or is out underperforming this quarter or outperforming who's my best client um, and, and Alexa any type of those answers Alexa will feed you back when you start taking additional data and feed it into and, 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 and match it with artificial intelligence what will happen as we go forward and if you don't have it you're at a big disadvantage as a company but Alexa will turn to you and say you know hey Larissa here's a solution to a problem you don't even know you have so if you can imagine being in competition with different companies and they have all this great technology and they're getting all this solutions to problems they don't even have, um, you know, it's why you can easily see that you can fail in business with that, you know, uh, beyond just right now using it to get accurate forecasting um, and get a bunch of intelligence that you can use that, you know, basic human interact, you, you, human action alone would not um, provide. You. So the big question is also, um, COVID-19, okay, um, how is big data really helping us fight coronavirus? Uh, May 23rd, really, as they really started talking about the shutdown and the breakout, and it was really getting, um, you know, on everyone's top of mind constantly 24-7, oh my God, what are you going to do? One of the first responses was at the White House, they put a supercomputing consortium together, mm -hmm. the most powerful ever in the history of mankind, with NASA, the White House, Amazon Web Services, the Department of Energy, RPI, MIT, IBM, Google Cloud, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, um, probably missing a few. But what happened is they basically got worldwide access to the most powerful resources. And the idea was to advance the pace of scientific discovery to fight, you know, in, in the fight to stop the virus. Their goal was to process massive amounts of data, do a bunch of massive supercomputing calculations that are related to bioinformatics, uh, epidemiology, all kinds of molecular modeling. And ultimately, that whole design is to help scientists develop answers to very complex scientific questions about COVID-19, right? In hours and days versus weeks and months, okay? And every time they get more and more answers in hours and days, 
you know, it helps them get to the solution a hell of a lot quicker. So the bottom line is matching the best ideas and expertise with the most advanced big data and super supercomputing uh, accelerates the process of discovery to unlock treatments and ultimately, you know, get a cure uh, and a vaccine. Uh, there are basically, um, go back, um, something else I failed to mention that they're using data with, which can be a little bit, um, it, you know, for some for some countries, for some people, privacy is, a, a, you know, top of mind. It's, it's an enormous issue. Uh, Apple and Google have announced that they will collaborate on software and warn users if they have come into contact with someone that's positive COVID-19. Okay, uh, so they're using this data to really trace and have a total quarantine awareness. So the concerns again about privacy are these technologies enable public health officials to track infected individuals, enforce quarantine measures, and create a community awareness. Okay, if you look at when this first broke out, there was a lot of good uh, press about South Korea, but also Singapore, Taiwan, and Israel are examples of countries that use data from citizens' mobile phones to perform contact tracing. That uses trajectory and geolocation data from the mobile phones to detect and isolate individuals who just came into close proximity to someone who tested for COVID-19 positive. Okay, so it's the same big data apps used by digital marketers, right, that identify and target potential customers with advertisements. Same, same apps is being used to, to glean data from smartphone apps and apply it to, you know, geolocation if you came close to someone with, with COVID-19. These tracing apps um, in Singapore to South Korea are now in Germany and over in these countries, there's less concern about privacy of your data. Um, so that's why they are using more effective apps. Um, uh, quarantine enforcement, China, uh, their Baidu, which is the Chinese Google, has developed an infrared sensor uh, for no contact screening that uses AI uh, and big data to identify fever, even in a crowd. Uh, they have color-coded healthcare apps that are designed, you know, on health status and your travel history, which is all derived from, uh, obviously, your data. Um, in the U.S., uh, Google recently announced anonymous and aggregated user data from mobile phones to help government agencies understand if social distancing rules are being observed in public places. Um, so is that Big Brother watching or is it something that we really need to embrace in order to fight the virus? Um, it also helps using the data uh, build community awareness. There are mobile apps, chat box, artificial intelligence uh, that really provide answers to symptoms and treatment questions uh, and will help you, uh, you know, locate a hospital with an available bed quicker. Uh, you know, the most available, quickest testing site, et cetera. Um, it'll also help with hospitals capacity planning, right? So if you're a hospital, you want resource planning. Um, you know, my brother, my oldest brother is a CFO uh, of a hospital in New York, and it's really just north of New York City. Um, and it was very scary early on because, you know, they're looking for refrigerated trucks because the morgues filled up. Then they were running out of body bags, literally. I mean, in, in the beginning of the New York, New Jersey, you know, breakout. So, you know, to make sure you have, you know, PPE equipment and more space and body bags and testing kits and everything else, you know, the data is crucial. It's the first thing they need. I mean, if you look at um, companies, those most responsible companies that you would look at there, you know, publicly or traded or, or private companies, you know, a lot of them literally got caught with their pants down. They're saying, wait a second, now, we have business interruption insurance. I mean, insurance companies say, no, 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 this is a pandemic. It's not covered. So how the heck do we get pandemic insurance? I want it now. The insurance companies are saying, well, wait, we need the data. We need to take the data. We need to compile it. We need to analyze it, you know, put it with our actuaries and come up with, you know, policies that have the right premiums and the right coverage that makes sense for you and us. Okay. So Without the data on this, you know, there are a lot of companies that are even looking for, you know, how do they protect themselves from another pandemic? Um, so it's, again, all about the data. I say that a lot because it really is. So how to monetize big data, right? So the last time you had me on, um, you know, I spoke for a bit with a deeper dive into big data. I don't want to take a big, deep dive into it. 
I just want to cover a couple of them. Um, you can always go back on, on YouTube and, and do a deeper dive on some of the other ones. Um, but we described a lot of ways to monetize big data, and most of those really do still exist, right? So there's no, re uh, no, no use, in, in my estimation, repeating all of them. Um, just a couple that I think are, are, are um, interesting. Uh, public companies, we discussed a list of them. I was particularly interested in a company called Datadog, DDOG, which was a recent IPO. The IPO was at 27. And because of the work that we do here at Wealth Colony, I was studying a lot of you know, the world of big data, those companies that are private, those are public, et cetera. And this one jumped out at me simply because um, you know, not only a local New York company, but really they turned down an offer from Cisco for $8 billion instead of going public. They said, no, we'll do an IPO. So they went IPO and they were valued at 10 billion. And my you know, basic idea was looking at the comps, looking at the amount of pipeline, I felt they would be a $25 billion company uh, you know, at least in a year and maybe even 50 billion. Because of COVID-19, more and more people, it became uh, literally um, it, more urgent to have, to be more mobile, to, to have your data, you know, you know, at your fingertips and have it analyzed and, and be able to be, a, a, you know, a, a lot more fluid and mobile of a company, a lot more versatile. Um, so um, that's Datadog. There's a private company that I love. I uh, told uh, Before yep. you go on, I have, well, I just want to mention, I want to remind everybody, make sure you're doing your due diligence on any investments you're making, pub public or private. But I also wanted to ask you, maybe you could tell us just quickly, because I know you have some other types of investments you want to talk about too, but um, what so, something like Datadog um, and maybe you know other companies that do something similar, are they all mining data? Is that sort of what their business is based around? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, they just have a portfolio um, of, of services that they provide you know, their customers. I mean, they take your company, they put it up in a cloud. I don't know that they're particularly mining data, but they're certainly analyzing it. Um, you know, for them to have a full pipeline and then add the US government and Amazon Web Services, I think speaks volumes. But if you're a company that doesn't have a big data strategy and you need to get everything up in the cloud and you need to understand your data and, and, and yeah, mine it and analyze it and process it a lot quicker, um, you know, that, that, that's basically what they do. I mean, they could basically, um, you know, take your business to another level by, by you know, you, you, instead of you building your own data center and hiring your own people to do that, it just makes sense to hire a company like that because they can scale. Right? Okay. Okay. So they act sort of as a third party for um, data and the information being provided. Yeah. Big companies go to them and, and, and you know, they, they'll, they'll not only take their business and keep it versatile and put a lot of things in the cloud and have redundancy, but they'll certainly analyze it and they'll have all kinds of strategies. So there's a, there's a whole, you know, Chinese menu of things they can do for a company in that space. You know, they're very good at what they do. What's really cool about that is I talked about a couple of companies last time that were private, like at scale and Palantir. I hear through the grapevine that Palantir is finally going to come public. Uh, one of the reasons that they're, they're a unicorn, one of these billion dollar plus valuations uh, that are private. But with Palantir, one of the reasons why they never came public is because, um, you know, like uh, in the beginning, 100 percent, then it was still like 90 percent of the business was the U.S. government. And so it felt that there was too much risk having just one customer. What happens if you get a new administration or, or, or some politician changes their mind for whatever reason or it doesn't pass and, 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 and they lose that account, there's too much risk. So they didn't want to go public until they were at least 50-50, 50, 50, 50 with private companies and 50% of their you know, revenue coming from you know, government. So um, I think they're about to come public. I think what's really cool, I think it's going to be another data dog is that company I talked about, ThoughtSpot. It's it's literally a bunch of Google, a few really smart Google execs that started it. And uh, it's really cool. It has a user friendly. If you go on ThoughtSpot's uh, webpage, they have an interactive dashboard. Uh, where you can start creating and modeling forecasting for COVID-19. You could say, oh, I have relatives in Greece or Ireland or Italy or Africa or wherever. Um, let me take those towns and you can start 
inputting data that's available through Johns Hopkins. That's the data that they use. Um, and you can put it and create and model some forecasts for COVID-19, which is um, really forward thinking and really cool. Um, again, they're, they're Google with artificial intelligence. And, right. So um, there's, again, a lot of really good companies that are out there. Some of the things they do are, you know, I read it, I kind of comprehend it pretty well. Um, can I explain it? Is it above my play, uh, pay grade? Um, somewhere so, somewhere uh, above my pay grade in a lot of these applications that I read about. But the more I read about it, the more you digest it. But uh, the basic idea for, like I said, ThoughtSpot is a Google with artificial intelligence that will let you search anything you really want with the benefit of AI behind it is, is, is just really cool. And I would advise everyone, if they're interested, to go on their website and play around with it. Um, what I call a pick and axis, like in big data, like the Lucent's, you know, of the world, when we had the, the, the Cisco's of the world, when the internet, the third inter, uh, industrial revolution came on for the, the information technology age. Um, I look at that as, you know, what one of the things we do, like in Script Mob 2, it's just a company that leases equipment because you can go buy really good equipment if you can get a good price, right? What are you going to do with it? Do you know what to do with the equipment to mine the data? You know, uh, on our website, Wealth Colony, we have a, a white paper we put there. There's 13 risks in building your own data center in-house if you're a company that wants a big data strategy. The biggest issue is typically it's too costly. Uh, it's hard to scale. There's redundancy issues. Uh, you got to worry about um, a, the, a lot of aspects before you do that. So it's a lot easier to just outsource it. So... Um, I've looked for other companies, uh, most of the bigger companies that if they do it, they have the budget to do it in-house. I think you'll see more of this type of equipment leasing, just like you see in self-directed IRAs, farming equipment or you know other. I've seen a lot of people get involved. We got involved early on in Script Mob 1 in 2014 in mining Litecoin when there wasn't even an exchange here, right? Then by time it went from under $5 a coin to $375 a coin. I turned around and there are mining operations in Iceland, in you know the Philippines. One's using uh, you know solar or or wind technology to to make the power cost you know reduced the cost of power a lot uh, further reduced to make it more efficient. There's geothermal in the Philippines. I heard so many different presentations that that's why we like to say, you know, we want to be in early, et cetera, and get out when it's trendy. Well, I think big data right now is is being in early because there's a, a, just a, a huge demand uh, in that space. Um, again, I've looked for other companies that do that, uh, but I would recommend that you look for something because this is key with the, 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 the platform that we develop. Not only do you have you know, a world-class partner that, um, you know, Intel, Samsung, that has the equipment, you have to find power, you know, if you're gonna use this equipment, um, wherever you're deploying the equipment, really a data center, you want to make sure you get the right cost of power because otherwise it's, it's going to mess up the business model. So you got to buy the equipment cheap. You got to basically have the right cost of power so that there's a you know, profitability. And as long as there's profitability to that company, there are companies in, in, that are growing, say in the world of produce or any, if, they, if they're growing, they're going to get a bunch of trucks to start shipping across the country. They're going to lease those trucks out. So there are companies that own trucks and lease trucks. Likewise, in the world of big data, we have a, a partner, and I think this is something that will be replicated out there, that owns their own equipment and puts it to work. But if you're going to lay out the cash, you lay out the cash, buy the equipment, they'll lease it from you, they'll pay you a lease fee for it, and then you can put um, you know, an insurance policy on that to protect that equipment so, you're, so your principal is secured and you're getting lease payments. I think that's a very cool way. Um, you know, the relationship between, you know, big data and your retirement um, could be monetized easily. There's one other thing to mention that a lot of people, you know, um, don't realize why I think, you know, self-directed IRAs and non-correlated investments in general, real estate, whatever, are becoming so popular is because of the retirement gap, right? So the retirement gap, according to the ACLI, is 19 and 23, meaning that the average American retires with 19 months of income, right, um, saved, yet 23 years of life expectancy. 
So people are looking for ways for their money to work smarter and last longer. And the number one fear of the, the baby boomer generation right now is, you know, outliving their money. So any any way where you can take your retirement account and have that money last longer, if, for example, you're making 20%, okay, in a self-directed IRA per year, call it an well, lease. And you want to just keep in mind, um, and this, you know, for everybody, you know, considering self-directing their retirement account, um, that, you know, your, um, your returns are based on your investment decisions. And so you just want to make sure that you're making those decisions, doing your due diligence on all of the investments and um, understanding the investments too. And, you know, that's why it's so important to have educational events where you can learn about things like big data and understand, um, you know, how they work. And we have webinars on things like investing in real estate and lending money and you know creating the terms for your IRA and and just really educate yourself and understand you know investments and you know and that would be the same with the stock market anything you know and Joe mentioned a couple of um, different you know investments you can make private and public and you know understanding your investments are going to be key to your return because you want to understand the investment that you're getting into so again due diligence is going to be very important on these types of investments. 100 percent there's 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 no way you would want to um invest you know anything particularly your retirement money unless um you know you were comfortable and you've done the homework and you know the only distinction that i was saying is you know this is some of the articles that we talked about before but um the distinction that i was talking about is if there's a way and you're comfortable and you know all the risks where you're looking and saying you know what I don't like all of my eggs in one basket. The reason for the retirement gap is often pointed to the fact that there's overexposure in the stock market. Everything's in there. So at the end of the day, if you're not totally exposed there, you're not going to see your retirement account drop as much. Theoretically, if a pandemic hits again or something happens in the market's down. And so, you know, that's what's out there. Obviously, you want to put as many um, as Advanta does a great job, as many different, you know, whether it's crypto or Forex or real estate or equipment leasing or, you know, private placements, hedge funds, whatever it may be, uh, there are alternatives out there. Um, you know, we just happen to right now love the world of big data. There's a lot of ways, public, private, you know, to, to take a look at it. And, and obviously, like you said, do your homework uh, before you would do anything. So. Here's here, here's some of the stats that we talked about before with Price Waterhouse. You know, it, it it's not a mistake. You know, um, that the market is you know often very volatile and people are looking for alternatives. So the, the space is jumping. This does not really even take into effect what happened with with um, you know COVID. I believe more and more people look for non correlated stock market investments you know probably as the market came back they're looking for a little safer haven um and you know if you find one that you're comfortable with Advan is a great company um, to put it with for sure um you know i if anybody wants to uh you know follow up on a conversation on anything you know book a quick call at calendly.com slash wealth colony and i'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have well, thank you, Joe. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's, you know, really what our business is based around, of course, the um, ability and the desire to have your portfolio truly diversified. Um, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar that there's just so many different asset classes out there. And, you know, the great thing is with a self-directed IRA, um, you're going to find that Although, of course, I do feel like largely any investment class, any asset class is going to have um, some correlation to the market, whether it's large or small. Um, you know, just the, the idea that, of course, um, your investment is not going to be directly invested into something that's going to take the swings that the market is taking. You know, and of course, we're seeing that now. Um, you know, I think a, a, a big thing that people um, really like about a self-directed IRA is being able to say, this is what I want to invest in. And so, um, you know, I think all of the um, information you provided with us today, Joe, on big data is important for people that really didn't understand it. And so, 
you know, I, and that's why I asked that question about the Internet of Things, because I think before, um, you know, you had really talked about it with me previously, it didn't occur to me that, you know, there's information being gathered even, even on things like smart refrigerators where, you know, you can go in and not only have your family's calendar on there, but it can tell you what you're missing in your refrigerator for your next grocery list and things of that nature. I mean, it really just never occurred to me that there was really a purpose behind that. And of course, that's a lot of what people are looking for today. So it's important to understand it. And Joe has his contact information up here if you have questions on big data. And of course, you can reach out to me, Larissa Green at Advana IRA with any additional questions on self-directed retirement accounts. And so with that, I want to thank Joe so much for joining us today. And we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, Joe. Pleasure. It was great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay. Take care, Larissa. You too. Bye-bye.